All right, a little bit of a, um, let's do a video on types of migration. I know that it's going to show up on the tests, and uh, it's important to understand these concepts. So I think probably the easiest is international migration, and this is when a person moves from one country to another, and they cross, and then they cross international boundaries or borders to do that. And you got to keep in mind, this is different than just visiting. This is permanence. Uh, so the idea is that they relocate themselves. So the map you see here is... Uh, the number of people who have uh, come into the United States from various parts of Latin America. And so you would say that this whole portion here in the center of the map is Latin America. And clearly Mexico would be leading the way in this. And I would say that is because of proximity and the amount of people uh, to the United States for sure. So there's your example of international migration. So nothing inside of a country is international migration that's important to know so it, it must happen from one country to another two types of international migration you have voluntary migration and forced migration so voluntary is is kind of as it sounds it's basically they're moving somebody's moving to another country for an opportunity and in the case of this slide you see that these are Chinese um, that were under control of the British back in the late 17 and 1800s and they are simply recoding, relocating from mainland China to these periphery islands here and the reason being is they were serving as uh, port workers under the British Empire and that was their choice to better themselves economically or have a better lifestyle to relocate so this is voluntary migration. Forced migration is there's no choice but to relocate. So often you see that because of like a political genocide where there's a, um, a group of people who are targeted by a government, um, whether it be race, religion, ethnicity, uh, or environmental factors. So this is probably a really good historic example of the French slave or the uh, African slave trade across the Atlantic Ocean where you had numerous slaves that were forced to relocate and migrate permanently. Another good one would be the Holocaust, so the Jews that were forced to migrate across borders um, to different countries uh, to attend to go to camps in uh, like Poland, for example, from Germany. That's be a forced migration. And here's another one, and this was interesting in that, see, Poland was this area, <clears throat> and then, uh, or sorry, Germany was this area, and then at the end of the war, this land was given to Poland. And... Um, you had a lot of Germans living here, and so many of them were given the option to move back to Germany. So if they were given the option to move, that would be voluntary. However, if the Polish government said, you are a German citizen, you must move, then that would be a forced migration. Nevertheless, a bad deal for the German population um, who weren't involved in the Holocaust. Okay, you have, when you're dealing with movement inside of a country, then that becomes internal migration. So no more international migration. And this is some degree of permanence as well. Uh, and people move more often internally than they do internationally. So two types, inter-regional and intra-regional. It's very important that you slow down and read those words because making mistakes by reading quickly, you will obviously miss questions. So if somebody is moving around in a country and it's interregional, they're moving from one region of a country to a different region of that same country. And I know that depending on what scale you're looking at, this could be confusing, but I want you to think, let's see if I have, here's a good map. I want you to think of if their movement changes landscape. So obviously if I start here in Missouri and I'm going to end up in um, the West Coast, I'm going to go through a variety of different landscapes. I'm going to go through different regions. So for example, if we take a look, if I'm in Eastern Washington and I move to Western Washington, I'm changing landscapes. I'm changing regions. Western Washington, um, I'm not changing a lot of different landscapes, so I'll be fairly uh, certain that I'm in the same region. So just kind of keep in mind that as a kind of a general rule, if I'm changing and the, the environment looks very different, um, it's more shrubbery, it's brown, doesn't rain, then I'm moving out of a region. That's all interregional migration. Uh, intra regional migration then is moving within one region of a, this should be country you're looking at. And so like uh, movement from Seattle to the um, suburban area of maybe Renton or Kent, or moving from Carbonado to Buckley, or maybe moving from Chehalis to Olympia. 
it's all intra-regional. It's the same region of the country. So here's a an idea. If I'm moving from the suburbs into or from the city out of, that's all inter or intra-regional migration. So this map then goes further and talks about two patterns that we're seeing in intra-regional migration, and that's counter-urbanization and urbanization. So as we talked in class, most people in like China and third uh, stage three demographic tr uh, trend or transition model countries, they're moving into main cities. This is the hub of eco uh, economy. This is where all the business goes. And so it's awfully tough to make it in the farmland nowadays. And so they're moving and migrating into those cities. So while it is still falls under intra-regional migration, the subcategory then becomes urbanization. That's uh, movement into for better health care and services and the chance for a better life. And the opposite effect, however, is taking place in many stage four countries, US, Canada, uh, Western Europe, for example, which is counter-urbanization. Actually, scratch that, Western Europe is very urbanized and is remaining so, but the United States is a good example where many people are moving out of the city into the countryside because it's a nice setting. Uh, it's peaceful. It's a good place to raise kids. This is why my family moved out to the country. And many times the amount of house you can get in the land is uh, much better than if you're in a city. So this reverse trend is happening as people have more money to have um, commuter vehicles or um, more time. Uh, those things are not available for those stage two and stage three companies the existence of a human is to work and not necessarily have free time. So there's a couple subcategories of intra-regional migration. Oh, uh, let's see. We can talk about, um, we'll do push-pull factors because that kind of factors into this. So these two are, if you're getting into why do people move intra, inter, and internationally, you have to look at what is forcing them. Uh, that is a push factor. Or what is encouraging them. That is a pull factor. And so typically, like I've explained, you have one goes with the other. In few circumstances, you'll have push only, like in war crimes or trying to get away from a, uh, a major war or conflict in a country. Those would be only push. But typically, people are leaving a place because of a problem, and they're moving to a place because there's an opportunity. Economic conditions, environmental conditions. Look, You have to look at culture or traditions that are changing. Um, <clears throat> political conditions where there's uh, war, like for example in Syria right now, uh, people are getting out, they're going to Iran, they're trying to leave in, in um, Turkey and other areas, they're leaving that land and that's a, f as a push factor. Uh, so if you just keep in mind that if you look, look at motives of people and why they're moving around, then you're going to run into push factors and pull factors. So that's a little bit on movement and migration and um, there's some more to it, but we'll, we'll leave it at that.